Okay, so let me start. I thought I will give this sort of title which might attract a few people. The CCG between Hilbert and space-based detectors of gravitational waves. So what is a CCG? See, actually the CCG, this word has come from astronomy and it was borrowed by Hilbert, David Hilbert, the mathematician. Okay. So here is the CCG, the picture right on this first slide you see the CDG, it's like an eclipse. When, when planets or astronomical bodies line up in a straight line, that is called a CDG. And uh, Hilbert actually used this for, uh, uh, you know, describing linear relations between uh, elements of modules or ideals in rings and basically polynomial rings over fields or uh, maybe general objects. So, what I'm going to talk about here is how his kind of thing, I mean, which he introduced in 1890, his ideas, uh, which were uh, later actually his questions were solved later in 1960 or 70 by Grobner and uh, his students, Buchberger, et cetera, in the 70s, who gave the Buchberger algorithm. And this can, uh, this can be used, actually, this has found use in uh, space-based detectors for gravitational waves. Okay, so the this is the CDG, and uh, that's where we are heading. So let me just give you a small uh, this thing of uh, maybe this is too big. Is it? Uh, it width is okay. Oh. Fit width is better than right? automatic. Okay. Ah, so a century long wait, and uh, we had the uh, detection of gravitational waves, a direct detection of gravitational waves in 2016. So, just for a history, 1915, the theory of general relativity was given. Einstein gave his field equations in 1915. He predicted uh, the existence of gravitational waves in two, two, uh, 1916. And 100 years later, he, uh, the direct detection of gravitational waves was done by the LIGO science collaboration. And I may say that it was a team effort. And there were these LIGO runs of the uh, 01, 02, 03, uh, which uh, showed that, uh, which have, we have found something like 50 black hole events, out of which two of them are black hole neutron stars, and one of them is a neutron star, neutron star event. The picture on the right shows the LIGO uh, detector in Louisiana. And uh, this picture right at the bottom, right bottom, is the uh, is actually the data. Uh, the, the particular, the first event which was observed, GW, whatever it is, 1509-14. Okay, and the two detectors, one at Hanford and other at Livingston, Louisiana. And you can see the waveforms are almost identical. So this was the first detection which was carried out. And after that, many of these detections were carried out. Okay, so after this, now we would like to see, this was with ground-based detectors. Now, the idea is, so in future, that is in 2030s and so on, or maybe uh, 10 years from now, to go to space and put us antenna in space. And the project is LISA project, or which is called the Laser Interferometric Space Antenna. So this is a huge interferometer, which goes around the sun. It's, a, it's in a triangular shape. And it, each arm is something like 2.5 million kilometers. It's a ESA and a NASA project. And what is the reason for putting uh, such detectors in space, first of all, they are very long, the arm lengths are very long. So your measurement <coughs> requirements go, goes down. See, the thing for ground-based detectors is you have to measure length effectively of the <coughs> amount, something like 10 to the minus 18 meters. Here, you can go down uh, 1 million times because your arm length has increased by 1 million. So you go to 10 to the minus 12 meters and which, so which has much less stringent conditions. So uh, the noises which occur in the ground-based detectors, here the noises are completely different. 
And the reason for going there is also that you can do low frequency circuits. With ground based detectors, you are basically limited to something like few hertz or 10 hertz or few hertz at the lower end of the bandwidth. Here you can go to something like 10 to the minus 5 hertz to 10 to the minus 1 hertz. And this is complementary to ground based detectors, just as we have different astronomies like the optical and radio. Optical is at the high frequency end, radio is at the low frequency end, and so on. So they complement each other and give us different views of the universe. So the, the kind of uh, uh, sources for LISA will be different. It will be supermassive or massive black holes or <clears throat> supermassive black holes going around each other, mergers of such things, or extended uh, or extreme mass ratio in spirals where small black holes fall into big black holes. <clears throat> so this is the launch which has been plan planned in 2034. And here is a sort of a picture of the LISA orbit going around the sun. It's a triangle, a giant triangle with 2.5 million arm kilometer arm length. Each hub is a spacecraft and houses lasers in it, and which shine lasers on the other spacecraft. And the laser beam from one end is mixed with the laser on the other. And the gravitation wave signal, which shakes up these arms, will be recorded as Doppler shifts in this uh, in the arm in the in the data stream. So the problem is that this is an unequal arm interferometer. So the point I'm coming to is that where we need the Hilbert's mathematics, okay? So this is an unequal arm interferometer, unlike the ones which you have you know, on ground, where you can make the arms as equal as possible. And this noise, which is called the laser frequency noise, is canceled out because the noise is <coughs> common to both the arms, it cancels out in ground-based detectors. But in space-based detectors, this is not possible because you can't make the arms equal. So this is a problem and this noise is much larger than other ambient noise like short noise and things like that. It's like few orders of magnitude higher. So when we have to cancel this noise, if one has to uh, get the requisite uh, sensitivity for LISA or the laser interferometric space antenna. So I'm going to, this in this talk, I'm going to tell you about uh, how this is done. How do you cancel the laser frequency noise? How this problem of <coughs> canceling laser frequency noise is in fact can be translated into a problem in algebraic geometry. So this is the thing. This is where Hilbert comes in because he sort of started algebraic geometry right back in 1890. So here is an unequal arm interferometer. So we have an unequal arm interferometer here, which is just like a Michelson. One is L1 and L1 is not equal to L2. Then the phase that is measured, say in one arm L1, is phi of T minus two minus L1. We have put C equal to one, just like all self-respecting general relativists and phi T, minus phi t. So this can be written as operators. You can think of d1 acting on phi, which delays phi by <coughs> the amount l1 over c or, or l1. <coughs> and phi of, so it's, it's a round trip, you get d1 square minus one acting on phi t. Here also you have phi two, which is in the other arm, which you, gives you d2 square minus one on phi t. But delta phi t, when they, these things are interfered, it's not zero. And so the laser frequency noise will not cancel here in this particular interferometer. But you can make it cancel. What you do is you take this combination. That means you make one beam go around this way and then let it go around this way. And this beam goes like this and let it go around this and then interfere. So if you carry out this procedure, what you get is d2 square minus one, d1 square minus one, minus d1 square minus one, d2 square minus one, and this cancels out. And this is basically what is called an LCN. That is the lower, lowest common multiple, which you do in school. You know, you have learned that 
the lowest common multiple of 8 and 12 is 24. So it's exactly like that. Here, these two polynomials, say in the operators here, D1 and D2, are relatively prime. So their LCM is simply the product. D2 square minus 1 minus D1 square minus 1. But anyway, that doesn't matter. And what you can see is this is commutative algebra. You are getting into the realm of commutative algebra. Now, this is the problem. Actually, this is so technically here, uh, the problem is the same, but uh, the arrangement for Lisa is more complicated. So this problem becomes high, much more complicated when you take Lisa. So here, all Li are unequal. And here is a triangle, which is there of the Lisa triangle, which is schematically drawn. Li is something like 2.5 into 10 to the 6 kilometers, which is 8.3 seconds. And one labels is streams, the data streams of one laser shining onto the other spacecraft and being measured there as U1, U2, V1, V2, V3. So U1 is along one side, U1 is where? So U1 is this, going from 3 to 1, U2 is 1 to 2, and so on. So these are the streams data streams which are there. <clears throat> so one laser say, gives out a stream which is which is <clears throat> beaten against the other, other laser on the other spacecraft. So you get data which is like U1, U2, U3, V1, V2, V3. Now this contains laser noise. That's the point. And this is what we want to cancel. In Lisa, the data is recorded as fractional Doppler shifts. And the laser noise component is CIT. We'll label it as CIT, which is delta nu it or nu naught. So delta nu i is nu i is the frequency. Nu naught is the basic frequency of the laser, <coughs> which is normally about a micron. And this is delta nu it or nu naught is the sort of the thing which is measured. But a data stream will contain not only laser noises. See, this is the laser noise from the third spacecraft beating against the first spacecraft. Plus, there may be a signal, which is a gravitational wave signal, U1. There are other noises, optical and proof mass noises, but these are small. So you want to cancel this noise, C3 here, this Cs, so that you, only these, things, these guys are left. So we use the algebra of finite difference. So write dk as before, as f of t, f of t minus lk, the delayed, the function is delayed by the amount lk. So then the six elementary data streams, if you looked at the picture there, is given by these things, plus extra terms, which I have not written out because those are not important to us. So D2, C3 minus C1, D3, C1 minus C2, and so on. So these are the streams which are there. And what we need to do is make a combination, a linear combination of P, U1, U2, U3, V1, V2, V3, in which the Cs disappear. So what one was, what one is doing is, what wants to do is write a general data combination X as PI VI plus QI UI, where PI and QI are polynomials in the operators, D1, D2, D3, and so on, and VI are the streams. So the laser noise cancellation condition simply becomes PI VI plus QI UI equal to zero, and one would wonder that are there, do such polynomials exist? Or such a polynomial, instance PI, VI are six polynomials. You can think of this as a six tuple, or, or by some abuse of language, you can call it a vector if you like, a polynomial vector of six uh, components, PI and QI. So there is such a component. This is called the symmetric Saganac, D1, V1, plus D2, V2, plus D3, V3, and all D2, D1, U1, and so on. And this, in fact, cancels the laser frequency. It's identity. So all arbit for arbitrary functions, C1, C2, C3, this gives you zero. So this is what is called a time delay in interferometric combination, or a TDI. This is an identity for arbitrary functions, and this is a combination. Another combination is the Michelson, and the one which I showed you, basically, which was there. This is called X, and this is a polynomial vector. As you can see, I write this out as a polynomial vector, uh, like this here. This is the Michelson, this was given earlier, not in this notation. This was the notation which was found, uh, was actually given by us in the, in, in the terms of uh, algebraic geometry. And uh, so 
This was followed by Armstrong Insta and so on in 99, 2000, and 2001. So now, our idea was to convert this problem into an algebraic geometry problem. So as you can see, these are operator polynomials. So we are talking about polynomial rings. And in case of the constant arm lengths, you get commutative polynomial rings. And this P's and so on, they form a module actually over this polynomial ring. So your polynomial ring, this, uh, this polynomials must satisfy these equations if you want to cancel the laser noise. So these are just these guys which are here. So you want to cancel this. These are three polynomial, three polynomial vector, uh, equations. Your Gaussian eliminate P1 and P2, you get one equation, which is this. So you need to solve this. And this is in fact called a CZT in Hilbert's language. Uh, CZG for him was a linear relation between polynomials in an ideal. So these things form an ideal, uh, these polynomials, d1, d2, d3, minus 1, and so on. And you are looking for solutions, p3, q1, q2, q3, which satisfy this. So you need a polynomial vector, only just <coughs> of fourth with four duples. So you have to solve for this. And for the elimination equations, you can get x. Okay. If you, if you manage to solve this equation. So this was a problem which he had posed like, for different reasons. But uh, we found that this is exactly the problem we are we also face. And in this case, we have this particular kind of equation. So just for making things simple, we write, you know, put a, things less cluttered, we write d1 equal to x and so on. So this p3, p1, q2 belongs to k4. k4 is this polynomial ring of q, x, y, z, where q would maybe rational, if you like, rational numbers, and x, so we have a rational field, x, y, z. And then p3, q1, q3 belong to k4, which is a module, a free module over this particular ring. And what is the solution space? So you define a map, a linear map from k4 to k. So this is p3, q1, q2 goes to this, which maps to a polynomial, over here, and <clears throat> this kernel, and we are looking for the kernel of the of this homomorphism. This is a homomorphism, and therefore the kernel is a module. And so this is a what is called the first module of CZGs, as was called by Hilbert. So this is the first module of five inverse of zero. And why do you want a kernel? Because we have to map, map the noise to zero. This is exactly what we want. We want a null space. So now resubstitute. So if you can find solve this equation, then you will be uh, you would have solved the problem. But Hilbert in his time could not solve this problem. It was solved by Grobner and his students, and uh, uh, basically uh, Bookberger and so on. So this is I'm just since there's no time for me to go through all the general algebra, I'll just give you the basic steps how you go through it. You obtain what is called the Grobner basis for the idea. So these are the polynomials which generate your ideal, and you find a Grobner basis, and this is the lexicographic order, and this is what is called a Grobner basis. Grobner basis is something like a GCD, or a, what we had is what we call HCA, the greatest common divisor. So just taking the analogy between the uh, you know, elementary school mathematics, eight and 12, the, uh, the GCD is four. So we go to the bottom of the particular ideal and see whether things divide. And this Grobner basis to a module, so you can build the module out of this Grobner basis. Form matrices connecting Grobner basis to the coefficient and vice versa. Then the generators of the module are given in terms of this matrices. So I'm not showing you the matrices all that because it'll take a lot of time. And, uh, but anyway, one can manage with these things to get exactly the module. So the above, this theorems guarantee the full module is generated and the above procedure generates the four tuple polynomial vectors and the six tuples are obtained by just from the elimination equations for P1 and P2. So this is a basic procedure, which has been which is a standard procedure given by Becker and Weiss Fenning in their book on commutative algebra. So these are the minimal generating sets. So the module has a generating set. Now, the thing is like this, this in vector spaces have a basis, but modules don't have basis. They have what are called generating sets because you want to span the module. That is our aim. 
we want to generate all elements in the model but we don't care whether they are linearly independent or not so but when we span the module this is the the, the elements are actually linearly dependent so there are linear relations between them okay so so you don't get a linearly independent set but you get what are called generators you try to make it linearly independent you want to span the module that's the problem so here's another generating set and this is a very nice simple set which was already found actually by uh, armstrong and uh, tinto and isterbrook and so on and uh, what we found was we gave it a good strong uh, mathematical rigorous formulation and this is related to the hilbert CG, ccg theorem and you can keep on forming the first module of ccgs you can find a relation between this and you get so there is a, this is a, these are not linearly independent so then you find polynomials which relate this put it equal to zero so that itself also for, forms a module and that's called the second module of ccgs and hilbert ccg theorem says that at most you will need uh, the number of determinants in that polynomial ring. In this polynomial ring, there were three variables. So maximum number of steps you need three to resolve the module. He didn't like you know modules like this. He liked what are called free modules, modules which are something like vector spaces, which have a basis. Anyway, so that is a, so this is related to CCG theorem, and we have it in our living reviews article how it relates to all these things. So. <clears throat> So this is the which I want. This is the thing which I wanted to basically say, is that uh, Hilbert actually at that time gave three wonderful theorems, and uh, one of them is this Hilbert CDG theorem. The other was saying that all uh, uh, polynomial, I mean all ideals over a ring over a field uh, has is finitely generated, and is famous null. Stellan's arts, which is called the zero set theorem. But this was one of the theorems, which was, uh, which is actually uh, important uh, or is relevant to our, our, to our thing. So what happens with this? So we can actually generate these polynomials and we can generate all of the TDIs, which are just linear combinations of these four polynomials. And then what is the use of this? I think I will, since I have a little bit more time, uh, I did not know how much time it will take. So I'll just go to the slide where you can see what, what you can do. You can maximize the signal to noise ratio. For example, if you have a source in the sky, say on the latitude, say uh, in, the, in the galactic latitude or not galactic, but maybe barycentric frame you have, and then you put theta v equal to 90, phi v equal to zero. Since the LISA is rotating and orienting itself in different ways, this source, although it is fixed in the sky, it is at some alpha and delta, some declination. In Lisa frame, it will it will it will describe an eight like this. So not every combination which we had there is uh, sensitive to that particular source. So what one can do is we can choose the most sensitive source at a particular time in this thing, at a particular time when the source is in a particular direction. So for this direction, we have one particular uh, combination, which is the most sensitive. And so we can track the source in the sky in order to, uh, in fact, maximize the SNR. So this is exactly the kind of idea which you have in radio astronomy, where you track a source. If you have a parabolic cylinder, like we have in UT, you can track a source just by phasing the array. Just change the phasing of the array and the source can be tracked. And so you can you can maximize or optimize the SNR for such a uh, for the radio uh, radio telescope. This is exactly the same kind of thing, but far more complicated. So this this is the kind of use one can put to one we can put to with this kind of thing, with this uh, that you can generate all the TDIs that are there for canceling the radio frequency noise. So now the thing is to the, it so happens, I mean, it just, the problem is that the uh, LISA is not actually a static thing. The arms keep on varying in length. So really you don't get uh, commutative algebra. You don't get commutative ring, but you get mildly uh, non-commutative ring. And though that is called a 
so then your uh, then your uh, operators become non commutative and then the whole problem becomes quite difficult in uh, in using non commutative algebra but i think uh, one way which people thought was to use matrices use representations of these operators and then the problem can be is more tractable so romano and wan uh, the tdi valisneri so on these people have tried to do that we have also given our own matrix formulation over here and generally i mean the whole d1 which i wrote there a matrix looks like this so you uh, uh, you discretize the data you sample the data then d1 is just this d1 yt is your data then d1 acting on yt is y minus one sample time d minus delta t and the operator looks something like this so it's quite simple here if your d is varying in time then it's become quite complicated i have not shown that and if you want to show for large uh, for longer time it's just t of m multiply uh, raise the this raised to m and you get y minus t m delta t now all those equations which i sh showed you before can be convert, converted to matrix or matrix uh, equations and what is the uh, and there is in fact what we showed over is that we have we have a ring homomorphism here so there is a ring homomorphism between these operators and the set of matrices and for all kinds of delays could be integer fractional time dependent and so on why fractional because to cancel the laser frequency noise we need to cancel the noise at the level of something like one part in 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 and in a million kilometers you must cancel things to something like within something like a kilometer or within a few hundred meters so that corresponds to a light travel time of something like uh, less than microseconds but the data but the data will be sampled at something like a second or so so you need fractional time delays but whatever the kind of time delays one uses this is in fact a ring homomorphism we have just shown this in this paper which has not yet appeared in physical review but it is accepted and will be published soon and we hope so that's that's the kind of thing so i come now to my last slide the results and future directions we have in general general method for generating all the data combinations for for constant arm length for cancelling laser phase noise and risa this was a paper in 2002 by myself vinay and rajesh nay and uh, we have a living reviews article uh, tinto and durandar then we can use the tdi to track the which i just show you showed you how you can maximize the snr and this method has been applied to other space detectors as well with different configurations there is the concept of the octahedral gravitational wave observatory with six space crafts 24 links so this paper is wang et al 2013 and there are probably chinese visions ga tai ji and tian quin uh, which are also there so this may be applicable to such detectors so this method can be easily extended to constant arm length but six time delays because the lisa is rotating there is a sagnac effect and the two lengths are not equal so instead of getting a polynomial ring in three variables you get a polynomial ring thing ring in six variables but the things are the same i mean it's much <coughs> it's very quite easy to calculate all the generators and there are in fact software to calculate this and this is called tdi 1.5 and this was done by nayak and vinay in 2004 and tdi of varying arm lengths the operators are non commutative as i remarked the matrix approximation is in fact easily as adaptable because matrices are naturally non commutative so this this thing adapts very well to matrices so the matrix approach is very uh, very useful as is we hope that the matrix representations are flexible easier to numerically implement in implement and manipulate so just as usually physicists use uh, uh, you know uh, these representations of groups rather than the group elements to obtain their results Year two, I think we think that the representations of these operators is a good way of uh, actually uh, doing this problem uh, in practice. Okay, thank you. That's my talk. Thank you, Sanjeev, for the fascinating.